Hi, Simon. You're on the air. Good morning. How are you doing this morning? Very well. Thank you for asking. How are you? Very well, very well. You know, it's an amazing province we live in. It is. It's, it, <laughs> it, it, it is practically, it is very difficult to try and get your driver's license within a seven and a half hour time period. <laughs> yes, that's true. And, you know, government is, you know, will take their time and consider all the, all the evidence and weigh it all out and have lots of meetings. And to have something done in seven and a half hours is a truly amazing achievement of efficient government. I would have thought... Hats off to them. Yeah, sure. I would have thought that seven and a half hours would have been a pretty good turnaround time for a briefing note to be prepared and vetted. Oh, you would think. You would think. I've, like, I've, 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 I've worked in the system and it often takes, you know, considerably more than seven and a half hours to get a briefing note done. But I guess, you know, if you want to dispense with that kind of thing, then, you know, you can use, more effectively use your time for other things. Mm -hmm. But what I find actually, you know, what I find remarkable in this is that nobody did anything wrong. Nobody is taking, you know, although the fact that, although, although, you know, Nick McGraw, has now moved on, is now an ex-minister. The last thing he says out the door is, no, I didn't do anything wrong, and not, 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 nothing was done improperly here. You have Davis, who is not taking responsibility either. Tom Marshall, on which all this happened on his watch, is completely silent on the subject. If you look at the report from the AG, and you look at what, and what McGraw says, said in the report, and if you look at what McGraw said at the time, in the House of Assembly, what he said at the time to the media, those things don't match up at all. Yeah. You know, he said that he fully consulted his colleagues, that everybody was fully apprised, everybody knew what was going on, and then the Auditor General comes in and says, no, nobody knew anything. So where do you go? Where do you go? Well, part of the problem, I think, is that, um, uh, you know, when you send an accountant to go do a job, then you're going to get back an accountant's report. And effectively, that's what the what the Auditor General's report is. It is an accountant's report. It can't, and you know, most critically, the uh, AG is unable to take statements under oath. Right. And that is an important thing. The AG is <laughs> unable to compel testimony. We talked about this really, really early on. You know, we talked about the fact that the AG is a good start, but really it's a very limiting kind of, uh, of, uh, of report because the AG is designed for a specific purpose, you know, to audit books and to audit processes. But it's not to conduct the kind of investigation that really needs to be conducted in this case. You know, the, the AG can look at a standard conventional government paper trail, but really no further than that. Well, and uh, that's also a problem when we go down the road of a judicial inquiry. If they can't subpoena uh, any of the paper that's not there, that's a problem. And when it comes to testifying under oath, can we get into the hearts and minds of who knew what when? So l let me just start at the beginning. If you are a, and you're a liberal candidate and a hopeful member of the House of Assembly, what are the gaps Prioritize them for me, in your opinion, where the gaps are on the heels of Patton's report. For me, there's many. I tried to speak to them off the top of the program. But for you, what are issues that can be solved or settled with a judicial inquiry? Just give us a few to, to latch on to. Well, the basic question is, you know, who knew what and when? And how did they find out? You know, for example, this business of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Kevin O'Brien calling up the deputy minister. Now, you know, because he's responsible for fire services. Well, you know, if the Minister of Health had called, would the reasoning have been, well, you know, fire causes smoke and smoke is a health hazard, so therefore it's perfectly reasonable for the Minister of Health to call? No, but there's, well, nothing, no, untoward, not there's nothing untoward about cabinet ministers speak with each other about tricky political decisions, especially when they have the implications that this one would have. So, I mean, is that really a big deal? Oh, I'll tell you what is peculiar. Is What's peculiar is ministers calling deputy ministers of other departments. Ministers talk to ministers. Deputy ministers talk to deputy ministers. Deputy ministers talk to the people within their department. But for, you know, for, for ministers to start calling up other deputy ministers in other departments, that's pretty peculiar because normally the protocol is if I have an issue with your department, you minister of X, Y, or Z, then I talk to you. I don't go around your back and talk to the deputy minister unless I first talk to you. 
So that kind of protocol is really kind of peculiar. And, you know, David says that, you know, uh, that O'Brien calls other deputy ministers all the time. And he says it's like this is a casual thing that's really not a problem. But the fact is that by going around those lines of protocol, yes, it actually does cause real problems. And in this case, it is causing a problem. You know, the, the, these folks are saying different things at different times, and they're not being, it's not being cross-checked. Yeah. And I think that's one of the big things about the Auditor General, is the Auditor General is not able to really look to challenge the testimony and to really test, test the testimony to see if it in fact is true and to really push the issue on exactly you know, who knew what when. I mean, fundamentally, I think really at the, at, when we get right down to the bottom of it, when governments start to make decisions based on their partisan interests instead of the interests of the people who elected them, I think we've really hit a watershed moment. I think we've hit a fundamental change in attitude, and I think it's really time for some of these folks to start considering moving on. And if they don't consider moving on, then that decision is going to be made for them. Well, I, uh, and I think that that's the, uh, the ability that people have when we have an opportunity to vote in general elections is to you know, uh, determine the fate of the political parties and individual members. I, like, I, off the top of the show, I thought with all the unanswered questions that were brought forward as a result of the Auditor General's report, and the only way to get to them, if he couldn't get the answers with his authority and mandate, then if there is another avenue available, in this case a judicial inquiry, then Paul Davis may have no choice. If he would like to set his government on a new course, he may have no choice but to go down that road. Whether or not he does, we'll soon find out, because there's no wiggle room or time or leeway going to be granted to the new Premier. There's questions to answer. He cannot be about political fortunes of the party. It has to be about address these important matters concerning the best interests of the people. Will he do it? Remains to be seen, but I don't think he has any options. Well, if you look back at the, uh, you know, probably the closest analog to this might be the fiber optic report that, uh, you know, a former Auditor General did on a former government. And if you look through that report, and it's funny because just the other day somebody brought it to my attention, I sort of scanned through it, and I found that, you know, that report really answered all the questions that were on the go at the time. It didn't, you know, it didn't get down into every little cubbyhole, but it did a pretty good job of answering the questions that were raised at the time about that deal. This report doesn't come close to that because it, it, it so deeply contradicts everything that, that people were saying at the time that you have to wonder, like, you know, what is really going on here? And I think the only way... And, I, and, and, and judicial reviews are, you know, tangly and can be really, you know, they're, they're something you want to say for special occasions. And I think we've actually hit the point now where this is an occasion special enough to warrant and justify a judicial review. What happened here, Simon? Your opinion. <sighs> People lost track of what was important. You know, they, they, there was a, a big hurry to get things done. Uh, decisions were made that were made on a wrong set of priorities. Um, you know, God knows how information got around the way it did. The whole business of the um, of the political leadership loomed huge in everybody's mind, and I think there was a little bit of desperation. They resolved problems quickly, 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 and you know, bad choices were made, and bad choices were made to benefit friends of government. And whenever bad choices are made to benefit friends of government, then that's always worth investigating. Who are the friends of the government? Well, you know, there's a $19 billion bond that's still flo- that, that was floating out there. We don't even know the circumstances surrounding that. Who secured it specifically? No, we don't. Yeah, that's an interesting part of the equation. So, hmm. And we're going to have to end, uh, you know, there are a lot more questions than there are answers. I mean, you're asking me a bunch of questions now. I don't have the answers for them. And, you know, the other general doesn't either. And they're worth having. Those yep. are questions that are worth having. They're worth for the they're worth, they're worth having. Uh, you know, it's, it's worth for the people of the province to have them and to derive some comfort out of this and derive some closure out of this. Yeah. Because I mean, even even for even for Davis, I mean, it's, this is going to hang over him now for the next twelve months. And Possibly. The clock is ticking on. But this. depends on how he handles it. Uh, how uh, forceful that clock is. It could be pounding like a metronome, or it could be a nice, quiet, swift watch. If he does it yeah. the right way, then he will indeed relieve a lot of pressure on him, and he can put himself forward as a change of approach that yep. uh, the PCs really need. So we'll see how he does it. While we're speaking, though, Simon, it's worth mentioning to our listening audience and to you, Steve Kent. 
Boy, oh boy, did he ever get a promotion. He's the new Minister of Health and the Deputy Premier. Payback in full. Wow. Well, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, among, among some people, the Department of Health is known as the Department of Hell because of the grief and trouble and, uh, uh, you know, constant issue that it involves. It's, uh, that's a pretty major job, and that's the kind of job that doesn't, you know, we don't need surface glib answers for the issues surrounding health in this province. We need real reforms. We need, you know, some serious policy formation in that department, some serious policy change, and just tweeting about it isn't going to do the job. Maybe not, although I will say that uh, Kent impressed me, and I thought he grew up a fair bit politically during the leadership campaign. I know that you and many others uh, have, and sometimes justifiably so, criticized Mr. Kent's behavior in the House and on Twitter and, and other areas. Were you at all impressed by his uh, behavior, his articulated policy positions and whatnot during the leadership campaign? Um... Well, you know, the proof is in the pudding on this stuff. Uh, you know, we'll see if any of this stuff actually comes to pass. Uh, you know, ideas are cheap. You know, really, honest to God, ideas are cheap. Anybody can come up with an idea. Anybody can scratch something out in a piece of paper and say, this is my idea. This is what I want to do. The real challenge is in trying to make it so. Yeah. It's trying to, you know, trying to carry it through. And that's the part that uh, you know, we've really seen missing. Well, I suppose we have to start with... You know, the yeah, idea, and then the, ex the execution, we will determine whether or not it's done in a timely fashion, whether or not there's a new role given to efficiencies in healthcare that can be found inside 7.5 hours. Remains to be seen. <laughs> That's right. Simon, I appreciate your time as usual. Stay in touch. One, 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 one quick little note before I go. Go ahead. Uh, tomorrow is, uh, we have five young students uh, from different schools across the city going to the National Debate Seminar in St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, these five folks have been working very hard for many months to train and prepare uh, you know, for this national event. They will be representing our province. Uh, I want to wish them all the luck, uh, and I hope that you know, I'll be able to get some of them to give you a call upon their return. I hope they do, and so safe travels and good luck. It's uh, what a learning experience. It's going to serve them very well as they enter professional life, too. Simon, good speaking with you. Take care. Have a good day. Same to you. Bye-bye. All right, let's get a little update here. What's shaking? Uh, Premier Davis is... Uh, Swearing in his new cabinet this morning. Okay. Darren King is the new business, tourism, and rural development minister. Susan Sullivan has been moved to the Ministry of Education. Interesting. Steve Kent, repaid in full. He's the Minister of Health and the Deputy Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador. That's quite something. Will we see Tracy Perry come in? It looks like Keith Russell will indeed get a ministerial portfolio. I think that some of this stuff, and let me say this, this is not just to uh, irritate anybody in Labrador. Is it important to have a minister from Labrador? I ask it for legitimate reasons. Is it more important to have people that are aware of and sensitive to issues in Labrador or to physically just have someone whose district office happens to be in Labrador? I think it's a legitimate question. Russell looks like he's going to be in, but is that by default? Because he's the only member of the PC caucus from Labrador, consequently gets a, a, a seat at the big table. I'm asking it for legitimate reasons.